Well, let's talk about hermeneutics. Studying God's word is so important. And, and it might be tempting for us to think, well, we've just talked about all these people with these heavy loads and crushing burdens, and we're going to get all academic and talk about Bible study. That doesn't seem appropriate. But friends, the, the Bible is our strength. It's our rock. We wouldn't know God without the Bible, and we wouldn't have comfort without his word. And, and so it is appropriate in times of deep distress to go to the word and to learn it better. You cannot go wrong when you, when you go to the word. You, you, cannot, um, you cannot lose out when you're understanding the Bible better. Um, I am amazed how alive it is. And, and we say this, and we've known this since we're children, but I was sharing with Bethany just today. Um, I'd been doing a good bit of reading in some other passages for other purposes. And, and this morning, I didn't have a lot of time, but I thought, I, I want to read something, but I don't want to read where I've been. I'm just going to... And so I, I cheated, and I reached over and grabbed her Bible and found where her bookmark was. I wonder what she's been reading. And I opened up, and I read a chapter, and... Twice today, that chapter has been very, very appropriate for what's going on. And I, I think, wow, I wouldn't have thought of that before, but because of my circumstance and because I read that chapter today, it has a new meaning. So I just want to encourage you, if, if you don't become academics and, and, and PhDs out of, out of this class, Helpful Hermeneutics, but if you love the Bible more, and if you read it more, and if you understand it more, we spend our time well. Let's review a little bit um, on our study of types and symbols. We talked last time about types. Where did the word uh, types originate? Why do we use the word types in studying the Bible? And we looked at several places in Scripture where we find that Greek word, tupos, um, that has the idea of a die, metal that is struck and bears the image of something else. Um, in Acts 7, it's the word fashion. In Romans 5, it's the word figure. In 1 Corinthians 10, it's the word example. And in Hebrews 8, it's the word pattern. All relating the idea of something that's made to look like something else. And in Scripture, when we talk about types, we're talking about something that looks like something else. The special thing about types, however... Is, is that they're made to look like something else before that something else appears on human history. But before it's ever walked across the stage of time, God has planted something, usually in the Old Testament, to picture something that God knows is coming in the New Testament because he wrote the whole story. He wrote the whole book. He knows the end from the beginning. This is akin to when in, in literature, a brilliant author d does what we call foreshadowing where they just kind of hint at something at the beginning of the story that the reader doesn't understand until they get to the end of the story. So that's what a, a type is. What do they look like? Well, they, they have to have resemblance. There has to be something that looks like something else. Um, there has to be a historical reality to the type. The type is the picture. The type is the original. The type is the thing we find usually in the Old Testament. There has to be a prefiguring. Now, this is key. It has to figure something else, it has to resemble something else, but it has to do it beforehand. Before the other thing comes to pass, it already looks like it. It's almost like a picture prophecy. It's, it's something that predicts, it has a predictive tone or element to it. Um, there's a heightening in that the anti-type, that's the fulfillment, that's the thing that comes in the New Testament. You have type followed by anti-type. The anti-type heightens it. It's bigger, it's better, it's broader, it's greater, in some ways superior to the thing that was original, that is the type. Um, next, we saw the divine design. That's the idea of prefiguring, that the God had a hand in this. It's not a coincidence. It's not just something that, oh, isn't that interesting? There's kind of a bit of a resemblance. No, no, no. God planned it, and it's obvious that his authorship was there. And then we saw... Um, a contrast, because sometimes people like to get type happy, and they say, this is a type, and this is a type, and this is a type, and some of it is semantic. Some people call it a type. Some people call it an illustration, but um, a lot of Bible students, and I would agree, say that there, there ought to be a, a difference, um, a, a level difference between an illustration and a type. 
And the difference being those things highlighted in yellow on the left-hand column, that a type is, is prefiguring and it shows divine design. And the way that we know that God intended it, the way we know that God planned it from the beginning, is that he says so in the New Testament. In the New Testament, God says this is like that was. That was kind of what I was trying to show you. Then we know that it was his idea, not just a, a coincidence, so to speak. We don't know what God plans unless he tells us. But if he tells us in the New Testament that I planned this to look like this, then we call that a type. Illustrations, they may have resemblance. There may be historical reality. There may be a heightening but it's not identified in the New Testament to show us that this was in God's mind from the beginning. Do you see the difference? It all has to do with divine intent and with prefiguring. Um, so then we saw some examples of types. This is all review. It's not on the handout from tonight. By the way, did anyone not get a handout for tonight? Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. Can we get a volunteer usher? We've got a few in the back. Thank you. We, we've got Brother Bird to the rescue. Thanks so much. Some types that we saw last time were Melchizedek. He represents Christ in a number of ways, and the New Testament specifically points that out. We saw that Passover represents um, Christ and his death on the cross, and we saw that resemblance, we can see it, and the New Testament specifically points to it. Um, we saw that other feasts in the Old Testament, the feasts of the nation of Israel, like First Fruits and the Day of Atonement, they represented things in the New Testament, and the New Testament pointed that out. Um, and then for one of just a very few times, I parted ways a little bit with the author that we've been getting a lot of our information from. Um, Dr. Zuck says that these four things are not types, but I kind of would call them by type. I guess it depends how you um, come up with your definition, but I believe that Adam, Moses, Jonah, and the brass serpent do make good types of the Lord Jesus because there is not only a prefiguring, there's not only a strong resemblance, there's not only a heightening, but the way it's, it's referred to in the New Testament, and when you look at the instance in its original occasion, it does seem like God planned it, like on purpose, like he planted it. Sometimes they, they talk today in cinema about uh, what they call an Easter egg, where you, you can watch a film or a movie, and, and there's something in there that the, the directors just kind of hid in there as kind of a bonus feature for you to find that you could miss. But then, surprise, there's this fun little thing there. And it seems like God planted these things. Um, God designed the, the life of Adam to represent the life of Christ. God designed Moses um, to represent Christ. And it's referenced in the Old Testament and the New Testament. This is all review, so I should probably just keep moving along. The next point, then, we're going to come to, and this is on your handout for this time, and that is how should we interpret types. When we look at a type, how should we interpret it? Because when there's an illustration for us in Scripture, we have to be careful that we don't misunderstand that illustration. First of all, determine the initial literal sense of the type. Now, this should fa sound familiar to some other laws of interpretation we've seen before, whether it was with figures of speech or metaphors or something else. Don't, don't say, well, because it's involved in a type, the original had nothing to do with anything. It was fake. It was a picture. It didn't really happen. That's not true. The types really did happen, and they had a literal meaning, and they had a literal sense. Adam was a real person. Adam was not a piece of poetry. Adam was not an illustration. Adam was a real man with a real life, and he really ate the fruit, and he really plunged the rest of us into sin. Um, Moses was a leader. Moses was a prophet. The brass serpent on the pole really happened to help those people who had been plagued by the serpent. Those things had an initial sense or meaning. But then determine the area of resemblance. How does the type represent the anti-type? And we need to define it and, and not let it grow and mushroom too far. In other words, um, in what way does the serpent represent Christ? Well, I, I think it should be apparent that there are certain ways that he resembles him and certain ways that he doesn't, correct? So what would be a way that the serpent that Moses lifted up in the wilderness, how does that serpent represent Christ? Who can, who can throw out a reason? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay, so the, the serpent was on a pole and Jesus was on a pole, so to speak. Okay, that's right. What else was a resemblance between the serpent and Christ? 
It was life-giving. Okay, so those people back in the Old Testament were dying. They were unable to save themselves, but when they, when they looked to the, to the serpent, they could be saved. Life was given to them. We are dying in our sins. We are unable to save ourselves. And when we look to the Lamb, there's another one, when we look to Christ on the cross, it gives life to us. Okay? So you could maybe find a few others, but, but it is limited in scope. And this is where we come to the next point. Determine the differences between the type and the anti-type. Are there some differences between the brass serpent and Jesus? What would be some differences? Okay, one's a snake and one's a person. Yeah, this is not rocket science. You're exactly right. What else? It wasn't actually a real snake. It wasn't a real snake. It was an image of a snake. Jesus was a real man. Yeah. To what extent did the serpent give life? Okay, they had to have faith in him, and we have to have faith in Jesus on the cross. Let me ask the question this way. Um, how long did the life last that the serpent gave? It was temporary. They, they got stayed from the plague, but eventually they did die. What about the life that Jesus gives? It's everlasting life, right? Is that where you were going? Yeah, okay, that's all right. But, but we, could, we could say there's some distinctions, and we need to clarify that. You can't just say, well, because he represents him in these ways, then everything about him is just like him. That's not true. Okay, another one that I, I think is a, qualifies as a type is, is Jonah. Okay, so turn to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. I'll be right back. Matthew chapter 12. This is where I come to the conclusion that Jonah is a good example of a type for Christ. Matthew chapter 12. You thought I was going to have you turn to the book of Jonah, didn't you? Matthew chapter 12 and verse 39. Jesus is talking. And he says, And an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man, that's Jesus, be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, because they, the people of Nineveh, repented at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Amen. Now, there's at least a couple of points of comparison here. Um, and this is a, a great text. I love this text for so many reasons. Um, but let's stick to our notes, and then if I have time, I'll, I'll give you some of my other reasons. I love it. What are some ways that the type, Jonah, does represent Christ, the anti-type? What are some ways that the type resembles the anti-type? Okay, Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, or the great fish. Okay, that's true. Um, why do you think, I mean, God orchestrated everything in that whole account. It, it says all throughout the four chapters of Jonah, and God prepared, and God prepared, and God prepared. He prepared a wind, and he prepared a fish, and he prepared a gourd, and he prepared a, a worm. He, he planned it all. So why do you think he had Jonah in the fish's belly for three days? Because it took that long to get to shore? Or I think God planned it because he wanted it to picture what was going to happen to his son. I think, I think it was deliberate. I think it was, it was intentional foreshadowing. Okay? What are some other ways that, that Jonah is a good picture of Jesus? He preached the message to the people they believed and they were scared. He preached the gospel. He preached the message, hey, God is going to punish you because of your sin. You better repent. Jesus, it says in Mark chapter 1, he, he started out and he said, repent and believe the gospel. Very similar to the message that Jonah gave. So they preached the gospel. Um, now, here's... Okay, now, i got to stick to my notes. i got so much I want to say. The, the next point in our outline says, what, what are some differences between the type and the anti-type? How is Jonah different from Jesus? Yes, ma'am. Okay. 
Okay, exactly. So we can't take the comparison too far, can we? Because G Jonah was rebellious. He did not want to preach, but Jesus came to seek and to save the lost, didn't he? Okay, so there's a difference there. Are there some other differences? I would say this is Jonah was actually upset when he repented, where Jesus said, if the boy that the boy in his comes back, or he's not always happy about it. Excellent cross reference. So Jonah, when Nineveh repented and was spared, Jonah pouted about it. And he, he, was, he was sad. But Jesus called it joy for, for all of this to happen. In fact, what made Jesus sad is when he looked and had compassion on Jerusalem, saying, how often I would have gathered you and you would not. He says, I wanted you to believe me, but you wouldn't. So that's the difference. And we could go on for a while, but you, you have to kind of consciously make that mental exercise. Where are they alike and where are they different? Now, in this case and in other cases, the scripture makes it simple for us. Does this passage tell us the major point of comparison? By the way, that's our next point. Focus on the areas of comparison made in the New Testament. What does Jesus say is parallel between him and Jonah? Look at our text, Matthew 12, 39, 41. What, what does verse 40 say regarding Jonah? He was three days and three nights in the belly's whale, or in the, in the whale's belly. And so he tells us this is the point of comparison. And then what about verse 41? The second half. They repented at the preaching. preaching of Jonas, and a greater understood preacher is here than Jonah. So the exact things that you all mentioned is exactly what Jesus said. The New Testament pointed out the primary points of comparison. The three days and three nights being buried and, and the preaching. That's the main way that Jonah is a type of Jesus. Now, what Jesus is is saying as he gives us this little lesson on typology is this. Jonah was not a good preacher. He was rebellious and he was selfish because he cried when they got delivered. Jonah was pathetic as prophets go. And yet, the people of Nineveh, that great city, those wicked people, they believed him and repented and got right with God. Jesus, remember we said in the type, in the anti-type heightens it. it. It fulfills it. It's bigger. It's greater. Jesus loved the people. Jesus was not rebellious. He was willing. And he preached the same message, essentially, repent, get right with God. And he says, you people rejected me. And I'm a better prophet than Jonah. Jonah preached and they repented. I preached and you didn't repent. The the takeaway is this. All of us are under the judgment of God because we've broken his laws. We have sinned. None of us are righteous. None of us are um, honorable before God. We, we all have a blotch. We all have shame. But God loved us so much that he wanted to make a way to remove our shame. And the way he did that was by putting our shame on Jesus, who was God in the form of man. And Jesus died so that our sin could be forgiven. Jesus took the punishment that, that we deserved. Jesus came to show us the Father, to show us God himself. And, and these people, and many people still today, reject his message. They say, I, I can't believe that. All I have to do is repent from my sin and believe in Jesus and I'll be forgiven. All I have to do is, is turn um, from, from my own wicked ways and trust in Jesus and I'll have eternal life. Ah, that's, that's a fairy tale. Ah, that's too easy. That's too good to be true. I, I'm not going to believe and I'm not going to repent. And yet the Ninevites, the, these wicked men, when, a, when a, a poor excuse for a preacher preached to them, they said, well, I don't know what's going to happen, but we're going to try repenting because we, we don't want the judgment of God. See, this passage, it's an example of a type, but really it's the core of the gospel, isn't it? We have to repent of our sin. We have to believe God's word. We have to recognize that I am, I am an, en I'm an enemy of God. And unless I believe in Jesus and what he did, 
I will be punished by God. That's how Jonah is an illustration of Jesus. Because Jesus not only preached that message, Jesus not only died on the cross to pay for our sin, Jesus validated his message because like Jonah, after three days came out of the whale, Jesus, after three days, came out of the earth. He rose again. He came back to life to prove that he was God and that he had every right to say that what he said and that everything he said was true. I, I used this illustration recently. Um, People wouldn't have much confidence in, in a lifeguard. Let's say they're at some swimming facility. If the lifeguard had drowned, they wouldn't feel like the lifeguard could help them very much. How's a lifeguard that's, that's dead going to do CPR on me? How's a lifeguard that's, that's dead going to pull me out of the water? But a lifeguard that's alive can save someone else. If Jesus had died for our sins and then stayed dead... What, what kind of a saver or savior could he be? If Jesus died like all the other religious teachers and prophets have all died and stayed dead, he's not unique and he can't help me. But because Jesus came back to life again, because Jesus did not remain dead after he paid for my sin, that proves that he is, a, he is an able lifeguard. He is an able rescuer who can take me and, and give me new life after I die. That's eternal life. Isn't God good? That's what makes Christianity special. So Jonah is a type of Jesus. Um, Moses in some ways, Adam in some ways are types of Jesus. We'll transition now to a different type of imagery in Scripture. We're going to call it symbols. Symbols. Um, it's interesting when you think about a, a, a symbol. A symbol is just... Um, and this is, I think, on your handout, an object or an action. And this is key in our understanding. A, a symbol is an object or an action which is assigned a meaning. It's assigned a meaning. That, that means that the person using the symbol says, this represents this. It doesn't, it doesn't do it naturally. It doesn't do it on its own. It, it has to be pointed out and labeled, Okay. So a symbol is an object or an action which is assigned a meaning to depict or to picture or to illustrate the qualities of something else. The qualities of something else. So a symbol is when um, a communicator, a teacher, a writer says, this looks like this in certain ways. This resembles this in certain ways. And you can understand this better if you think about this. It's, it's a symbol. The Bible is full of symbolism, Old Testament, New Testament, it's all over the place. What do you think would be some reasons why God would use symbols in his word? Um, this is not a trick question. Um, think about reading the Bible if it had no symbols. Think about reading the Bible with the symbols that it has. Why do you think God put symbols there? Okay, it helps us understand it. Don't we all do better when we have pictures? That's why books for people who are just starting to read have pictures to help them understand. That's why books that convey complex information have diagrams or pictures or foldouts to help us understand. Pictures help us understand. Good. What else do symbols do for us? Okay, so a symbol kind of kind of draws people together to unite under the, the banner or the brand name or the team logo. Uh, a, a symbol is something that, that um, can, can bring unity and help us to identify um, with it. Am I expressing it right? Okay, good. What's another thing that symbolism does for us in Scripture? We, we talked about this with figures of speech a number of sessions ago. Symbols um, make truth more memorable, don't they? I mean, do you remember pictures more or paragraphs? Remember pictures more. And so when God gives us a picture, it's to help us remember. Um, I think symbols also help in that they can make sometimes an abstract truth more concrete, more solid, more touchable. Um, yes, go ahead. Yeah. It's a reminder, it's a monument, which is a symbol of, of what God had done for them. Sure, I understand that. Um, 
So all of these are good. They make truth interesting. They make truth more, more tangible, more memorable. And they make truth more beautiful. And God doesn't do anything halfway. If he's going to write a book, it's going to be a good book. It's going to be quality literature. It's going to be beautiful language. And, and so many of the symbols in Scripture just, oh, they're just, they're pleasant. They're good. And, and that's our God. So how is a symbol different from a type? We spent a number of moments talking about types. Um, what makes a symbol different from that? Well, you can think of it this way. A symbol pictures a certain ongoing characteristic. In other words, when somebody says this is a symbol of that, they mean that it will continue to be a symbol of that. It's, it's kind of an ongoing relationship. Whereas a type is something that is fulfilled by the antitype at a certain point in time. Um, this is one of those places where I think an example is going to help more, more than the words. For example, in Scripture, oil, what does oil symbolize? What is, of, of what is oil a symbol? The Holy Spirit, excellent, okay. So when did the Holy Spirit complete that picture and the Holy Spirit is no more represented by oil? It, it hasn't happened. The oil still symbolizes the Holy Spirit, doesn't it? Oil is still for us today a picture of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's not like it was this prediction and it came true and it was over. On the other hand, um, the Feast of First Fruits we saw is a type of an aspect of Jesus' life and ministry. At what point did Jesus fulfill the Feast of First Fruits? It's been a few weeks. Okay, thank you. Good. I was getting worried. Yeah. At his resurrection. He was the first one to be raised, and we will someday be raised like he was raised. So he was the first harvest of souls. So that happened, and though it's still a picture for us to see, it's complete. It's fulfilled. It's, it's done. The package is, is all tied up. So oil continues to symbolize the Holy Spirit for us today, just like it did for the Old Testament people of God centuries and millennia ago. But... Jesus completed the picture of, of the Feast of First Fruits. That's the difference between a type and a symbol. Is that making sense? As we look at other examples, you kind of keep that in mind and see if, if it becomes even more clear. Um, here's another way that a symbol is different from a type. A symbol has assigned or labeled or designated association. In other words, somebody has to tell you this is a symbol of this or you might not have figured it out. I mean, think about it. Uh, unless scripture had shown us over and over again, um, would you have thought oil? Oh yeah, Holy Spirit. The, the Holy Spirit is just like oil. Well, no, but, but God kind of hinted at that over and over again until we get it. Um, but um, what about Jesus fulfilling the Feast of first fruits? Is that really hard to see? I don't think it is. I think it's kind of clear. You have this first good thing that comes, and Jesus was the first good things that come. Um, a symbol has an assigned association, whereas a type has an intrinsic association. There is something built into it um, in and of itself that represents the other thing. It's a very natural association. Um, that word intrinsic just means um, inside of itself. Um, so, a symbol has an assigned association, whereas a type has an uh, intrinsic association. Here's another example. In the Old Testament, um, Ezekiel saw a lot of very um, vivid visions. The, the stories of, that Ezekiel saw, the dreams that he had, are, you might even be tempted to say, bizarre. They're strange. They're weird. Um, this scroll goes flying around, and um, this woman gets put inside a basket, and these eagles pick up the basket and fly away with it. And it's just, it sounds like something you would dream after you ate something really spicy. <laughs> okay, but these were inspired visions. These were dreams that God gave. Okay, so in Ezekiel, one of the visions was, Ezekiel is, is there, and, and, and God says, look in this valley, and what do you see? Dry bones, meaning bones that, that had been um, from a creature that was dead for a long time. There, there was nothing left on them. 
And they were old, white, dry bones in the valley. And, and God came to the prophet and he said, Shall these bones live again? And Ezekiel knew better than to give a dumb answer when he didn't know what he was talking about. And he said, Thou knowest, O Lord. <laughs> I don't know. That's a good thing to say in class when you don't know. Just make the teacher feel good. Uh, so Ezekiel says, I, I don't know. What do you think? And, and God told Ezekiel, I want you to preach to these bones. Preach to the bones. Now, I, I don't know. Sometimes, you know, early in the morning or late at night, I've preached to people and they've seemed kind of dead. But this is a little extreme. They weren't just dead. They were skeletons. And, <laughs> and, and God told Ezekiel, preach to the bones. And he did. And then this incredible thing happened. God, in the vision, miraculously brought um, tendons and sinews and muscle and skin over these bones, and, and people came to life. And, and God said, that is a picture of the nation of Israel that's going to look dead as it can be, and I'm going to restore it. Well, would you say that has intrinsic association? Like the last time you saw dry bones, you're like, oh, that looks just like Israel. Or does that have a signed association? It's a signed. The only reason we understand that the dry bones represent Israel is because God told us that they represent Israel. And when you keep reading in that chapter, you, you come to the explanation. Okay, what about this example? Um, in Passover, and even at other times, the Old Testament people of God constantly were killing lambs. Um, for m one reason, for one predominant reason, to, to pay for their sins. Then Jesus comes along as the Son of God um, to pay for our sins, and he's killed. I is there kind of an intrinsic, obvious association between those two things? I, I think so. Okay, so that's an example of, of a, a type not a symbol. A symbol, you have to be told, this represents this, or you wouldn't get it. A type, it's a, it, it's a prediction, it's a prefiguring, and it's obvious. Once you read the end of the story, it's like, oh, I understand. That looks just like this. It doesn't need as much explanation. Um, so those are some differences between um, symbols and types. Let's, let's quickly talk about, oh, very quickly talk about how we should interpret symbols. Number one, note the object, the referent, that, that's the thing that it's talking about, um, the thing that it pictures. The object, the referent, and their similarity. This is a lot like how we interpret types. Um, you look at them, and then you say, what's the same about them? And then look to see if the context is going to explain it. All right, so there's a lot of symbols in the book of Revelation. In prophecy, we find a lot of symbols. Let's test out our method in Revelation chapter 9. I want this to be a Bible study as well as a study on Bible study. Turn to Revelation chapter 9. I think most of us who've read Revelation have it sometimes found the symbolism challenging, and I am definitely challenged by it. There's a symbol in Revelation chapter 9, verse 1. Um, this is in the portion of, of Revelation that is what we call the trumpet judgments. There's seven angels going to blow on trumpets, having to do with God judging the world in the end times. And the fifth trumpet we come to in um, Revelation 9, 1. And the fifth angel sounded, or blew on the trumpet, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. What do you think is a symbol in this verse? The star falling from heaven. Do people, I mean, do, do you normally give keys to stars? No. Do, do stars have hands? Okay, so I'm, I'm thinking this might be a symbol. Let's keep reading. Verse 2. And he opened the bottomless pit. Well, who does he referred to? The star. So now a personal pronoun is being used in reference to a star. So now I'm really pretty sure that this is a symbol. This star is a symbol of a he. 
And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And it goes on to talk about the judgment of God that was unleashed on planet Earth when this star who had the key opened the bottomless pit. Okay, so what are our steps for interpreting symbols? Uh, note the object, the referent, and their similarity. Well, I don't know what the referent is yet. I don't know to what the star uh, points me. All right, well then step number two said, see if the context explains the symbol. Does the context explain the symbol? Hmm. Well, I've got a clue. It's something that can open a pit, the bottomless pit. So what could possibly open the bottomless pit? Do you think it's a person, like a human being? I, to me, the bottomless pit is something a little too grand for a normal person to open. Could be... Could God open a bottomless pit? Could. Um, anything else you think of that might be able to open a bottomless pit? Maybe an, maybe an angel? Jesus? God? I, okay, well, let's, let's keep reading and see if there's any um, help for us. Um, why, don't we, why don't we turn to chapter 20 and, and see if we find anything more. Did I write that down right? Chapter 20, verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. So any ideas what the symbol in Revelation chapter 9 represents? It seems like it represents an angel, doesn't it? So this is where it's good to read Scripture and read Scripture and read Scripture. If you get all hung up in chapter 9 and quit reading, you might not ever figure it out. But if you keep going, you come to chapter 20, like, wait a second, key of the bottomless pit. That sounds familiar. Oh, yeah, chapter 9. <gasps> the star is the angel. Okay, so check other passages of Scripture is, is the next step in interpreting symbols. See if the context explains the symbol. I got a little bit of a clue when it said it got the key and it opened the pit. That narrowed it down. But then when I got all the way to chapter 20, okay, other passages of Scripture really helped spell out for me what that symbol represents. Then I would say this, look for one major point of similarity. Look for one major point of similarity between the symbol and the referent. Okay, the star um, came from heaven and came down. Angels are in heaven and he came down. Uh, I think another good example of this is um, in Matthew chapter 5, because of time and its familiarity, I'll, I'll mention it to you. Jesus said, ye are the salt of the earth. Okay, that's a symbol. The disciples and Christians today are not literally sodium chloride or potassium chloride or any other salt. We're just symbolized by salt. Well, when hermeneutics tells us that we should look for one primary representation and we should look for clues in the context... Can we do that to understand what Jesus meant by using the symbol of salt to talk about his people? What does the rest of the verse say? Ye are the salt of the earth, if the salt have lost his savor. Now, I, I think salt is a good symbol for Christians in a number of ways. We know that it's, it's different, we know that it preserves, we know that it does lots of things. But what is the aspect of the symbol that Jesus is emphasizing in Matthew 5? Salt is salty. Salt, salt has a different flavor. He's, he's, he's focusing on that component of salt, and that's what he was trying to illustrate to his disciples, to say, you're different, and you're going to have an influence on the world around you. Just like salt is different from what you put it on. You don't put hamburger-flavored salt on hamburgers. You put salt-flavored salt on hamburgers, and it changes the flavor of the hamburger. See what I'm saying? So, so we're to be different, and, and therefore we influence and we change that where we're placed. So look for one primary area of similarity. There can be more than one similarity, absolutely. But often, one area of similarity is predominant. Wow. How should we interpret symbols? Next, we should realize that a symbol resembles different things in different ways. A symbol represents different things in different ways. The symbol of a lion. 
What does a lion symbolize in Scripture? So I'm getting different answers. Conflict in the church. What a great message. <laughs> some of you are saying Jesus, and some of you are saying Satan. It's true, isn't it? 1 Peter 5, 8 says, The devil, like a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And Revelation chapter 5, 5 says, The lion of the tribe of Judah is worthy to open the book. So we need to recognize with symbolism that sometimes a symbol resembles different things in different ways. And that's why it's important that we focus on the way that's being intended. In what way does a lion symbolize Jesus? He has the power to open the book. In Revelation 5, everybody's weeping because nobody's able to open the book. And they say, don't worry, there's one that can the lion has the power to open the book. Okay? Uh, in what way does the lion symbolize Satan? He wants to devour us. He prowls around. He's, he's a hunter seeking to destroy. That's different from the way Jesus is like a lion. And, and so we have to look at the context to know the way that it's... Because if we get lazy, we just think, okay, lion equals this, lion equals this. Not necessarily... Look at the context. Also realize that one referent may be depicted by several symbols. One referent may be depicted by several symbols. For example, there, there's more than one symbol of Jesus in Scripture. Can you think of something besides a lion that symbolizes Jesus? A lamb. A lamb. What else? Bread. Grape juice. We'll get to that in a second. Um, I heard another one. What did you say upstairs? The gate, the gate, the door. Um, what about the branch? The root? Okay, okay, so all kinds of things symbolize Jesus. Don't get locked into thinking, well, because there's one symbol, that's the only symbol there is. God's very picturesque, and he's given us lots of symbols. Um, what about the Holy Spirit? What, what things symbolize the Holy Spirit? We already mentioned one. What symbolizes the Holy Spirit in Scripture? Oil, okay, anything else symbolize the Holy Spirit in Scripture? A dove, very good, yep. John chapter 3, the wind symbolizes the Holy Spirit. Okay, so all, all of these things are pictures that in one way help us to understand the Holy Spirit better. It helps build our mental, biblical definition of the Holy Spirit or of, of Jesus or whatever. Okay, um, we need to not assume that a symbol in a passage removes all literal meaning from the passage. Just because the passage contains one symbol doesn't mean the whole passage is like a pretend story or an allegory. We'll turn to Revelation again, for example. Revelation chapter 19. Uh, this is a beautiful, familiar passage. Revelation 19, 15. This is towards the end, and so this is when things are getting better and better. Um, 1911, John says, I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. That's my Jesus. Verse 12 describes him. He had crowns. His eyes were fiery. He had a, a name that nobody knew. Verse 13, he was clothed in vesture, dipped in blood. He's called the Word of God. That's how I know it's talking about Jesus, because the Word is a name for Jesus. But look at verse 15. And it says, Out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. Do you think that's literal or symbolic? That's a symbol, isn't it? Jesus doesn't have a sword sticking out of his mouth for all eternity. It's a symbol. It's a, it's a symbol of his power and the power of his Word. That Remember, Jesus spoke and the worlds were formed. And, and so the things that come out of his mouth are powerful, like a powerful sword. And the scripture is called a sword elsewhere, isn't it? The word of God. Okay, and then it goes on to say um, that basically he made wars and, and fought against the nations of the world. And, and he wins. Well, the fact that there's a symbol of the sword in Jesus' mouth, does that mean that Jesus doesn't really fight the nations? Jesus doesn't really win the war? 
It doesn't mean that. There's literal meaning to this passage, even though there is a symbol in the passage. We do this all the time in our own speech. We'll use a symbol for something to illustrate a, a real truth that we're trying to communicate. So don't go to one extreme that says, oh, there's a symbol, so all of it is a symbol. A part of it can be a symbol and part of it can be literal. Finally, I would say do not make a symbol out of everything in prophecy, especially if some of those things could very plausibly be literal. Um, for example, I'm going to turn to Revelation chapter 8. This is especially true in interpreting symbolism in prophecy. We'll talk about prophecy specifically more later in this course, but let's look at Revelation chapter 8. Um, this is the first part of those trumpet judgments. We saw chapter 9 um, with the star that opened the bottomless pit, but in Revelation chapter 8, um, the first angel sounded in verse 7. And it says, There followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of trees was burnt up, and all the green grass was burnt up. Do we say, all right, there's symbolism in Revelation, and so I don't really think that um, all the green grass will be burned up in God's judgment. I don't really think that a third of the trees will be burned in God's judgment. No, I, I, that could happen. Amen. And I believe it will happen, and I believe it will happen literally. I don't think that's a symbol. A star falling from heaven and getting a key, okay, I, I think that has to be a symbol. But fire falling from heaven and burning up trees and grass, that could be very literal, and I think it is. What about uh, the second angel, verse 8? The second angel sounded, and a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. Is it possible for something to fall out of the sky into the sea? You ever heard of a meteorite? It's very possible. Well, what happens when a meteorite falls in the ocean if it's big enough? Well, it goes on to say, <clears throat> It fell upon a third of the rivers and the fountains of waters, and the name of the stars called Wormwood. The third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died. Okay, and it talks about, oh, I, I skipped some verses, didn't I? I'm sorry. I, I thought that wasn't right. Verse 9, a third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. So this mountain falls into the ocean, and a third part of the ocean life dies. And then it says it becomes blood. Well, you've got that many sea creatures dying, there's going to be a lot of blood. So is this symbolic? I don't think so. I think it's literal. So there are some who would sanitize scripture of all the things that are unpleasant and say, oh, this is just symbolic. It doesn't really mean that. I think it really means that. And we need to be careful not to make a symbol out of all the prophecies, um, especially when they could be very literally interpreted. Well, I have a whole other slide of symbols I wanted to look at, but I think all of us are, are getting weary and well-doing at least you're getting weary and well-doing. I'm getting weary and doing. I don't know how well I'm doing. Anyway, uh, I, I do have to hit one thing I forgot, and then we'll, we'll save the other for the next time. That bit about different um, symbols representing different things, these are just fun. If you want to write extra notes down, you can. Um, a dove in Scripture, uh, as you all mentioned, symbolizes the Holy Spirit. But the dove in Scripture also symbolizes the disciples. Because remember, Jesus said, I want you to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But if we go back to the Old Testament, Hosea chapter 7, God says that um, Israel is like a dove that, that is flighty and can't make up her mind. Um, she loves me, she doesn't love me. You know, like a bird that just gets scattered all around. So uh, doves can, can symbolize different things. What about, um, what about sheep? What do they represent? We talked about already Jesus is the Lamb of God. The lost sheep of the house of Israel. And, and this is where um, the Lord showed me something in my reading this morning. Isaiah chapter 53. In the same chapter, it says, All we like sheep have gone astray. But then it says, when it's talking about Jesus' crucifixion, He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shear, his shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. So within like a couple, three verses, Jesus is compared to a sheep, and we're compared to a sheep. So we need to understand the part that's symbolic. 
we are symbolized by sheep and that we wander around and we do our own thing and we often make mistakes. Jesus was symbolized by a sheep and that it, he was meek and he submitted to, to the death that was given to him. Is there any book quite like the Bible? No. Is it rich? Yeah. God has given us a great book. Keep studying it. Keep looking for those symbols and appreciate the beauty and the pictures that God has given us to help us understand and remember his truth.